Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for taking the trouble to come and listen to us speak this afternoon. Um, I would like to thank the, the, the um, uh, Asahi Foundation for having awarded me this prize. This prize is going to open up many opportunities now, new opportunities to go on to do, continue to do the work that I've been doing on data and improving the quality of data in the next few years. Natural disasters in this, this year, just in this year, we haven't even, we are not even halfway through. Natural disasters has been a very familiar um, item on the newspaper front pages. You must have gone through the, seen the floods in Libya, which is terrible, terrible floods, the wildfires a bit all over the world, including Canada and Australia, the heat waves already in this year, there has been several heat waves. And so there has been natural disasters for the first six months of this year, which have been varied and which have been very importantly, not only in poor countries not only in poor countries. So these are events that are now occurring and giving, creating a lot of distress and devastation in countries which were previously protected from natural disasters. Natural disasters used to only happen in countries like Bangladesh or Benin or Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, these kinds of countries. Well, no longer, that's over. So now we are all in the global planet, we are all exposed to the natural disasters that I just mentioned. The, unfortunately, my topic in which I've worked for all these years, that's data, is not a fantastically exciting topic. If you say the word data, and even worse statistics, it makes people either slowly fall asleep or they start looking at the iPhones and think of their dinner plans. This is not, data is not something that excites anybody. Nonetheless, fortunately for me, data has become, data and evidence has now become central to policymaking, central to policymaking, and rightly so. So in other words, earlier on, what did we have? We had policy which was based out of, I would say, my, my boss, my, my professor once said, uh, e eminence-based evidence or evidence-based evidence. So, so eminence-based is that I'm a big person, I'm an important person, I'm a scientist, I say this is true. And evidence-based decision is when you have data, it's objective data, and you use that to say, this is the data and this is how it should be done. Now, it has become much more central to making policies and in natural disasters also, in the world of natural disasters, this has become a very important central um, item, central discussion point, as you may have seen in the previous COP27. The COP27, so we are now preparing for the COP28. COP27 had one of the main resolutions of COP27 was that we need proper data on economic losses and damages. So it's become a, it has become agreed by hundred some countries who have signed on to that resolution. I will go through very briefly some of the methodological challenges involved in collecting data worldwide on natural disasters. So when we started this whole thing, this, this was in 19 goes back in time, 1985 or 1988, something like that. We started doing this, this MDAT database and we faced a lot of resistance because there was a lot of pushback in that this was an impossible dream. You cannot, you cannot collect data from 184 countries systematically. This is not happening. So there was a lot of pushback Fortunately, my boss was very much behind us and said, well, try it, try it, let's see if it works. So we started working first on the methodology. 
methodology. How do you actually define data, de define disasters? How do you classify them? And here you see on this slide ways in which classification became important. We had an expert group. We brought together people from the insurance companies, from academic uh, institutions, from practitioners, the Red Cross and things, and we set up a um, classification system. And these are the different classifications that we have, we still use. We set it up in 1988 and we still use the same classification. Now that is a very important thing, the point aspect of a good database is to keep, set up the methodology from the beginning and keep it right through the entire time because only then you can actually compare 1998 to 2002. If you, if, you, uh, if you get what I'm saying. So the comparison across time and comparison against across space. So if you want to compare Australia to South Africa, the only way you can do it is if your methodology is standard. So what does this standard methodology, what does it show us now? For example, we have now the data that shows us for the global, for globally, it shows us that approximately 41% and 35%, so, so that's nearly 70, what, 76%, 76% of all affected people, 76% of all affected people by natural disasters, 76% of all affected people by natural disasters are due to floods and drought. Those are the two natural disasters that have the most important effect on populations globally. What has been the changes? This, this is just overview um, data, overview statistics. What have been the changes in uh, the different indicators of the impact of natural disasters? For example, the biggest changes have been in, if you look at the first, uh, so the biggest changes has been in disaster events. So the numbers of disaster. So in this decade, we had about uh, just over 4,000. And by the time we come to this decade, we have nearly the double numbers of disasters. So there was a very big increase here. And there was also a very big increase in economic losses. So the amount of money that was being lost, the amount of damages, economic damages that were being lost in um, 19, what is it, 1990 to 1999 to this decade here, was also nearly double. So the economic losses had increased a great deal. And we'll, we'll talk about the economic losses a little more um, later on. When we look at the distribution, the pattern of economic losses over the world, this is what it looks like. I mean, it's a rather a simplified um, graph. It looks something like this. Now, what does it mean? What does it show? In fact, it shows that the largest economic losses are in the Asia region, over here, and in the Americas. Now, essentially, in the Americas, most of the economic losses are actually contributions from the United States and Canada. So the, the South America contributes very little. Most of the, the, the economic losses here are from the United States and Canada. And a very large proportion of the economic losses in Asia are from China and Japan. I would just want to point out one small comment on this before passing to the next slide. Uh, economic losses are a very misleading indicator. It's a very misleading indicator. Why is it a misleading indicator? It's a misleading indicator because it is a direct ref reflection. It's a direct reflection of the wealth of the country. So when you have a uh, hurricane in Texas or in Florida, or you have a hurricane or a cyclone in Bangladesh or in Nepal, the value of property in either of those countries that I mentioned. The value of property in Florida and the value of property in Bangladesh is vastly different. Remember that's, for example, in Bangladesh or in Nepal, very few people are insured. And most of the economic loss data, a lot of it, comes from insurance companies. 
Now, if you're not insured at all, nobody's insured. You're poor, you're a poor person, you just have a shack for a house. The destruction of your house is worth very little. Very little. So therefore, poor countries are very much uh, very badly represented by this indicator, as you can see in Africa. So Africa has a very low economic loss. Does that mean that there are fewer, there's less disaster affected population? No, it's just the value of their assets are very, very low. So what are the main, main challenges that we faced by when we created them that it's taken us 25 years to actually get it to a shape that we think is more or less uh, adequate and now we want to move on to the next phase. What are the challenges that we have faced? First of all, as I mentioned earlier on, sound methodology in data collection techniques. Sound methodology in data collection techniques. This is, this is extremely important and it's very much neglected. People just collect data on disasters and stick it in there without thinking of whether or not the methodology is standard. This is a very important quality of a good global database. Second, definition of variables and inclusion and exclusion criteria. Inclusion and exclusion criteria is a concept that comes from medicine, from clinical trials, and in clinical trials, which are trials on, on, on medications and pharmaceutical products, what does it mean? You have to have a very clear criteria for entering any patient into the um, study group. So you cannot just say, oh, here's another patient with malaria, he got, comes in. No, you have to have very clear this age, this weight, this kind of a background. This is the characteristic of a patient who can enter the study group. That is an inclusion criteria. And so for disasters also, we have an inclusion criteria, which means a disaster has to have 10 persons killed, 1,000 persons affected, a call for international assistance, and, the, and I think um, uh, 100,000 US dollars damage. So we have a kind of a criteria, and if a disaster does not enter that criteria, it does not enter in that. So we often have people saying, oh, but we had a, we had a disaster in my country, in Italy, you know, and it's not there in MDAT and that. Well, that particular disaster did not meet our criteria, and so it's not there. So you have to have very strong inclusion and exclusion criteria, Checking for validity when there is a data point, how many people have been killed, you need to know whether or not the number you're putting into your database is valid. You have to cross-check and valid, and we can talk about it later on. Completeness and accuracy, since it's a global database, completeness is really important. You cannot have a database in which half the countries are missing data. This becomes a big problem, and we'll see, we'll look at that later on. Let's see some of the uh, applications of these criteria for, um, for quality of data. Countries. For example, this is a map of, a country, of the countries with the average, uh, average annual disasters in the period mentioned in the title. One can see that the countries that are the, the darkest, darkest colors are here and here. United States is, a, is, is, is very, very subject to, to, to uh, natural disasters, and many of the Asian countries here. Now, this has two interesting points, this map. This map has two interesting points. One is that the frequency of natural disasters is very much subject to the geographics, where you're located. Where is your country located? That is, unfortunately, is a structural issue. You cannot change it. If you're sitting on a highly seismic area, if you're sitting on the volcanic uh, ring of fire, if you're sitting on areas with cyclones and hurricane spots, you cannot change where are your countries. So the geographic location is a very important thing. The other important aspect, which is misleading in this map, is that big countries, big countries tend to have more disasters, simply because they are big. They cover a lot of space. So their exposure to natural disasters is much higher because they are just big. However, in Asia, you will find that there are many small countries 
that have had very high frequency of natural disasters, and that is because of what I said in the first place, geographics, where they are located. They are located in harm's way, in seismic areas, in volcanic areas, in cyclone paths, and they get whacked by every single natural disaster that comes around. So let's see, let's see here, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So here we have the trends in global natural disasters from 2000 to 2022. The, the global natural disasters, this line, and I will show you the next line. Wait, let's just see this line first. This line is all natural disasters. So what is all natural disasters? All natural disasters are climate-related disasters, hydrological disasters, meteorological disasters, climatological disasters, all of those, plus geological disasters. So earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, uh, dry landslides. This is the line that shows you the evolution of climate-related disasters. And what do we see? What is interesting about this? The interesting thing about this, this is a sh rather a short time frame, I must admit. It starts at 2000, I think, there. yes, it, 2000. So if you, even if you, if you look at it, if you go 20 years earlier, if you look at from 1990 or even earlier, this, these two lines were very far apart, very far apart. Now, as time goes on, they are getting closer and closer, closer and closer, which means that, in fact, MDAT shows that most of the natural disasters in the world today are actually climate-related. So our problem is focused on climate-related disasters, and that should also drive resources for controlling um, the risk on climate-related. So I think, as um, the previous speakers, uh, Richard and Penny, mentioned, I think that's a, that was a very important thing they mentioned. When do you stop looking for evidence? When do you stop looking for evidence and move and act? So now we have COP27 that said we need evidence on loss and damage. We have the evidence on loss and damage. We have enough evidence on loss and damage. We have to now act. So that was the, the previous slide showed you all the, the um, natural disaster events, just events, just occurrences. So here are the trends in affected per event. So it's been standardized. So it's not total affected, it's affected per event and deaths per event. So they are, they are on a double axis, double axis. So this one is an affected axis because affected are much more than deaths. You could put them on the same graph and see anything and this is the deaths. Now we see over here, now the, there are two peaks. I mean, I just want to point out two things over here. There are two peaks. Um, there's a couple of peaks in the deaths, and there is a peak, two peaks in the affected. Both these peaks, both in the deaths and in the affected, are actually linked to floods and droughts. I had already showed you before about floods. These are linked to floods and droughts. Floods and droughts, and I think both those peaks are China and India, both of them. The, the China and India are countries where there are a lot of rivers and they are mostly plain rivers. So in other words, rivers that run through plains, which means when there is a flood, they devastate enormous areas of land, enormous areas of land. And so the effect of floods in these countries, and now in many more, as you have seen this year, are tremendous. We are talking of 100 million, 200 million. In China, 300 million people who are directly affected by these floods. The distribution of the different, I just I put them in separately because otherwise it becomes a tangle of, um, of lines. Climate-related disaster events for the same period. The Floods and storms, and storms, are way more frequent, and in fact, way more, are much more severe than almost any one of the 
other disaster groups who are creeping along the bottom here. The only one that is in fact has an uptick at the end and has actually been slowly creeping up over time are extreme temperatures. Heat waves are going to be a problem. Heat waves are going to be a problem now and heat waves are going to be a bigger problem in the next 10 years, bigger problem. And heat waves is particularly annoying because they are extremely hard to measure, quantify when does a heat wave start. Does the heat wave that starts in India at this time and India takes this kind of a definition of three days of temperatures over 35 degrees, is it the same as in South Africa or in Zimbabwe? And that makes it very difficult to compare heat waves. Heat waves is going to be one of our biggest struggles to measure the impact in the long run. Just a few words on my area of discipline, which is my basic area of discipline, epidemiology, the, the impact of these climate disasters, of floods or cyclones on human health, on human health. What, does, what does it mean when there are, there are these floods in people's villages? Here you see a child who's hanging out its clothes to dry, his family's clothes, I suppose, standing in water and He's wearing his clothes, probably the only set of clothes he has. This child is going to sleep in these clothes. They, they don't have any other clothes. That's all they have. So either they will take this, either this child will take these clothes off and sleep naked, or he will sleep in those clothes. He is also standing in this water. This exposes him to several diseases which are very common and which for malnourished children, unvaccinated children, can be fatal in a matter of two to three days. This child is exposed to, this one in particular, I think, the, is in Bangladesh. Uh, this one in particular in Bangladesh, exposed to leptospirosis, to dengue fever because of mosquitoes of stagnant waters, to malaria, and of course that all, everybody in this auditorium knows on diarrhea. Diarrhea in a malnourished child is a matter of 48 hours. 48 hours before the mother can even take him to the nearest clinic, the child is dead. The second problem we have with global data is um, global data tends to hide things. If you look at it from the world's perspective, it tends to hide things. So here you see in every year, where is it? In every year, the total number of people affected by flooding is going down. Quite a, quite a happy trend. If you look at Africa, if you look at only Africa, the pattern is exactly the opposite. So if you take it in the world level, it's, a, it's looking pretty good. You can say that, hey, look, you know, people are, people are affected by floods less and less and less every decade. But if you look at Africa, it is in fact just the opposite. So we now need data at a much more subnational, much higher resolution. Countries, having data at a country level is simply not enough. But flooding also, it just, you know, I do a lot of field work. I'm out in the field very often for natural disasters and for civil conflicts. And it's always amazing how people find solutions to their problems. People find solutions to their problems. They will do whatever it takes. The ingenuity of people on the local at the local community level is incredible. And I think we miss a lot of the gold if we don't take into account what is happening on the ground. Actually, it says the, it says the same thing, except that we see what's happening. This, the yellow part of it is the people affected in millions, excluding India and China. So uh, if you see, and you see in fact that India and China contributed a very large proportion of people affected by floods in this decade, 1992 to 30, it less, much less in this decade, and then substantially less in this decade which indicates, suggests that maybe disaster preparedness in those countries have really worked better than uh, we think. Extreme temperatures, I wanted to, this is probably one of my last slides on. Um, 
Um, yeah. Um, on, on trends, extreme temperatures is a very, very important, significant phenomenon that is going to increase in the last, in the next few years. And as it, as it shows here, the deaths per event, deaths per event have been increasing very much. Heat waves was not a phenomenon that killed a lot of people. In the last four or five years, six years, it has been killing a very large number of people. There was a huge heat wave in, in Europe, as some of you may have heard in 2003, and then another one in 2006. And about 72,000 people died. 72,000 people died in the European Union, in rich countries, 72,000 people. We have a very big problem in MDAT with gaps in data. This is something that needs to be handled, and that is why I, the, my, my last slide will show you what we are planning to do. We have a very big problem with gaps. So here is data that shows what proportion of disasters do not report economic losses. So essentially, when you see for floods, what is it, extreme temperatures, heat waves, 90% of the heat waves don't report any economic losses. In by continent, which is these guys, those guys are Africa. 90% of disasters in Africa do not report any economic losses. So those things will have to change in the next few, in the next phase. And that is what we are trying to plan on. The phase one has been the MDAT data collection. Most of it we've been doing from secondary sources. We collect it from other people. We validate it, cross-validate it, and there's a whole protocol of how we um, uh, deal with the data. Phase two, which we are hoping to start in the next year or two years, we would like to shift to survey data, to collect much better data from the ground. We would like to get agreements with satellites, for satellites to provide us with data on the footprints of the disasters, and the creation of data cooperatives, to, to have big databases to cooperate in there with, between themselves. How do we impact policy? Most of the time, we do a lot of writing in newspapers, and we go to the parliament. We go to the European parliament, we go to other parliaments, we go to executive boards of UNICEF and so on and so forth, and we advocate. And every year, we organize a joint press conference with um, UNDRR. You know, that's the, the UN body, Secretariat for Disaster Risk reduction, and the USG, the Under Secretary General, Mrs. Mami Mizoturi, she comes regularly once a year and we present the data, and those have a big impact. They, they do have a big impact. Last slide, how can we improve? Better models of socioeconomic impact. Most of the models are meteorological and climatological in nature. They are very good data, excellent models, but very few models take into account the human impact of natural disasters, very few. The data is not good enough, or people are not interested, I don't know, but most models are meteorological and climatological, and we have to move to socioeconomic models. Second, resolve methodological challenges. I've already gone through that. There are major methodological issues. Those have to be resolved. And finally, we need to use higher resolution subnational data on disaster footprints and exposed populations. This is a huge gap in the current situation and that needs to be, that needs to be addressed. Natural disasters is no longer something that happens in poor countries over there. And we give some money for the Bangladesh aid and we give some money for this and we send clothes over and blankets to Nepal, I don't know what. It's no longer that. First of all, it's a problem that is a global problem. Second, we need to take into account in our development programs, in our development policies, that disasters, climate disasters, climate extremes are a huge setback to all the money we are pouring into development. We are putting all this money into development and there's one big disaster and that whole money that we have invested is, goes back again you know, 10 years again, and we start again. This has to be dealt with, and we also need, finally, we need to deal with the issue that this is a problem that affects people. There are people in the middle. There's a lot of data. We deal with data all the time, but at the end of the day, it's that child who's hanging out the clothes. 
who's affected. It's a child who's hanging on the clothes that's affected. And we have to keep that in mind all the time when we work on these issues. Thank you. Thank you.